Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm here to speak to you about the end of life care and critical care setting. It is basically a tale of two specialties, merging of end of life care into critical care. And can I have the next slide, please? So end of life care in critical care in intensive care unit. The next slide. Yeah. Uh, so end of life care and intensive care unit is trying to achieve a delicate balance between maximizing the medical support in intensive care with advanced latest technologies, as well as trying to achieve maximizing comfort. I would like to at the offset thank Karnataka Pulmonology Association for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak about this topic, which is quite closer to my heart. Next slide, please. So why is the end of life care in critical care setting very important? Because despite the best intentions as a treating physician, when we try to deliver high quality of end of life care uh, in the acute environment, it's going to be quite difficult, quite challenging as well. There are different challenges which we are going to face as a treating physician and trying to find out what is the best approach for that patient is what we'll have to uh, deal with. The main important thing over the course of my discussion would be how important it is to communicate with the patient's family with regard to offering future treatment plan, because it is easy to decide end of life care on anyone, but it doesn't stop there. It might result in conflicts on misunderstandings and miscommunications. So it is vital uh, to face that at every stage. And the only way to prevent such a uh, sort of challenges is communication, communication, communication. So is it easy for implementing end of life care in the hospital setting? No, definitely not. 80% of the people would prefer to die at home, but only less than half will die in the usual place of residence. Next slide. So the ICU is not an ideal place to die because one, the patients are isolated from their families. They are under an umbrella of a varied multidisciplinary team. So, you know, it is quite difficult to establish a rapport with just uh, uh, one single doctor or one single staff. So it is not the ideal place to die. And communication because of the patient's low uh, GCS sedation and neurological status is quite difficult to achieve. And there is always elements such as are we managing, you know, are we assessing the pain and other symptoms and making the patient sort of comfortable in the terminal stages of life. These are things which are, uh, uh, which bring us into debates and dilemmas as we try to implement end of life care. Next slide. Thank you. So the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine has come out with certain guidelines which are there available in their website for all of you to have a look at it. They update, keep updating it quite often so that you know, we are in par with what's happening in, with regard to India. Just as Rabindranath Tagore had said, death is not extinguishing the light. It is putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. So the end of life care is a multidisciplinary team approach towards a holistic care for people with advanced, progressive, incurable, or life-limiting illness so that they can live as well as possible before they die. The process of care, you have to understand that is not just limited to the person who is dying, but also extends to his or her families and caregivers. So when we as a treating physician are, are trying to implement end-of-life care, the main objectives which we have to address is one, is, is the patient going to achieve a good death for are we trying to implement a good death for any person who is dying irrespective of the situation, place, diagnosis or prognosis of the illness? We have to emphasize on the quality of life in the terminal stages of their life and the quality of death. The bottom line is you'll have to understand that end of life care is a basic human right and every individual has a right to have a good, peaceful and dignified death. Next slide, please. So who makes these end of life discussions? It is done by the senior medical team in review who have got extensive knowledge and experience in dealing with it. So what do they exactly do? The best practice is to have them as a part of a team to sort of you know, decide on who goes on end of life care. And it with the aim to include that an explanation that patient is in the last stages of their life with limited reversibility of the underlying condition. You'll also have to assess, the team also has to assess the current treatment and care 
based on the patient's uh, care goals. And if there is any living will or any documentation of what the patient's wishes was, if they reach the terminal stage, that has to be also addressed and looked into. We also have to look at what interventions are needed and are no longer useful. That is withholding or withdrawing treatment. So once we make all these decisions, it has to be discussed as a part of a multi and interdisciplinary team and should be documented and communicated with the colleagues as a part of the routine handover. The discussions should also be offered to the patient's family at all point of time. Next slide, please. So I've, I've written a couple of uh, lines here, which is LPA, lasting power of attorney, ADRT is advanced decision to refuse treatment. These are not used in India, they are used in UK. But the reason why I'm mentioning it here is it is important that we live in a geography village where especially during COVID era, it's a matter of time before all these you know, are being implemented in our country. So it is always good to know what happens in the rest of the world as well. So the first one, LPA, is lasting power of attorney, which is a legal document which is being signed by the, the previous slide, uh, which is the legal document which is uh, being signed by the um, uh, patient when the patient has been compensated. ADRT is advanced decision to refuse treatment where the patient, when he was mentally competent, makes an informed decision that if he reaches a stage of life where it is going to be terminally ill, he makes a decision to refuse treatment. So this is LP and ADRT. The next slide, we speak about patient's best interest. What exactly is the patient's best interest is, it is done in consultation with the patient's family and any written statements from the patient. So we as a treating physician would like to know what exactly was the patient's wishes. So this is an attempt to make the same decision as the patient would, should he or she have the capacity to do so. So we are trying to see from the patient's point of view, when they were well, when they had a good quality of life, what their best interest would have been if they had reached the terminal stage. So these are things which are not at come here, but which are used in the Western world, but which needs uh, you, you to be aware of. So now coming to the legalities which are faced uh, legal position in India. The next slide. The next slide, which uh, end of uh, ACP is advanced care planning, which is also used in UK. So in the next slide, we have the legal position in India. Yes. In India, the legal guidelines and provisions clarifying moral ethical dilemmas are on end of life care do not exist at present, unfortunately. So this has been put by the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine in their website as well. Much debate has been centered on and off over the course of years on the issues of euthanasia, suicide and right to life. Clear separation of euthanasia from FLST, which is foregoing of life support treatment has not yet been acknowledged. So the Indian physician is finally left uh, fi finding himself or herself in an ambiguous position with respect to civil, criminal or consumer protection laws. That's why we need to make sure when we try to implement the end of life care that we look at the legalities behind it and make sure there's no conflicts arising before we implement it. Next slide, please. The Aruna Shanva case is a landmark case which has been uh, highlighted uh, in the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, this has been a case where due to unfortunate circumstances, a staff nurse was left with a permanent vegetative state for nearly 37 years. And uh, after much discussions just recently in the past few years back, the judges pronounced involuntary passive euthanasia to be lawful under certain strict safeguards. The court then decided that withholding or withdrawing of life support was not illegal and should be allowed in certain circumstances. This is why I'm saying that the uh, judges then at that point of time said that it was considered withholding and withdrawing of treatment, although not practiced in India, was considered normal pr medical practice in the Western world. That's why you need to know the legalities which is happening elsewhere as well. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what is medical futile as well as inappropriate? So when a senior medical review team reviews a patient with regard to 
are we going to put the patient at end of life care or not? We have to decide how medically futile the patient is or how inappropriate it is to continue treatment. So the idea of futility is not new. You should know the famous Hippocratic corpus included a promise not to treat patients who were overwhelmed by their disease. So there are various definitions and subtypes of futility, five such ones of physiological futility, quantitative, qualitative, lethal condition, and imminent demise futility. So what is physiological futility? A treatment that cannot achieve the physiological aim. You should understand that we're not just treating the numbers, the vitals, but we have to treat the patient as a whole. Quantitative futility, where there is less than 1% chance of it being successful. Qualitative futility, treatment that cannot achieve an acceptable quality of life. Treatment that merely preserves unconsciousness or fails to relieve total dependence on intensive care. Lethal condition futility, where the patient has an underlying condition that will not be affected by the intervention and which will lead to death within weeks to months. Imminent demise futility is the intervention that will not change the fact that the patient will die in future. So the next slide is recognizing such medical futility. So once we are able to recognize all these five stages of futility, we also have to understand that those patients who are in the end stage of renal, hepatic, pulmonary, cardiac, or whatever it is where the maximum medical and surgical options have been exposed, that the senior medical team can consider as medically futile. Examples of other examples would include severe refractory illness with organ dysfunctions which are unresponsive to treatment, Coma, such as uh, which is caused by acute uh, severe neurological states, such as traumatic brain injury, extensive bleeding, extensive infarction, progressive metastatic cancer, where all the treatment options have been explosed, uh, explored, post cardiac respiratory arrest with prolonged poor neurological recovery. And the bottom line is any clinical situation coupled with the experienced physician's prediction of a very low probability of survival. So once you recognize these are medical futility, then you will have to try to implement the end of life care. Can I have the next please, slide, please? So dealing with the dilemma of end of life care issues. So what do we do when we have to deal with the dilemma of end of life care? Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so once we decide on end of life care, we'll have to decide there are going to be few dilemmas because it's not easy and straightforward. It is going to be customized for each and every single patient. So the uh, deciding team as an intensivist, as a senior medical team, we'll have to decide, are we dealing with a pathology of uncertain prognosis? We have to make sure at all point in time, we are avoiding strong predictions that this is disease is going to be fatal. So we never know how the disease behaves at times. And sometimes they might have uncertain prognosis. We also have to understand from the patient's family what the patient's wishes was exactly should such a terminal stage occur. And we have to question ourselves that is the proposed treatment going to give the patient a good quality of life? Are we just going to treat the physiological parameters, just the numbers in the monitors, or are we able to achieve a good life for the patient? These are dilemmas which will occur in any treating physician's mind before they try to implement the end of life care. So as you can see in the next slide, that you know it is a, a delicate balance between achieving what is a curative care to what is a palliative care. So it's a fine line. So once you decide that the palliation is going to be set, uh, involved, palliative team, which means more of a symptom control management, it also is divided into hospice and death and bereavement care. So the whole of palliation as an end of life and critical care setting is sort of intermingled with the curative care to the palliative care, the hospice and death. The next few slides we'll see if, uh, further on about how we break the bad news. So once we decide on end of life care, it is important to break the bad news to the family. So the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine has registered an acronym SOLA, which is a non-verbal communication to the patient's family. So S is quietly at the eye level to indicate your interest and involvement. O is open body posture. L is leaning towards the patient and family. E is eye contact, R is relaxed body posture. So in the next slide, you can see that, you know, the long and short of this nonverbal communication is you're making the patient's family 
comfortable in a discussion. So this acronym is just for those who are trying to use the Breaking Bad News scenario for the first few years of their, uh, ex as an experience in their years of practice. Over the course of time, you will develop a sort of, you know, subconscious, uh, ways to uh, implement this non-verbal communication but what you're trying to tell the family through your body language is that you're open to questions you're very receptive you do you are empathetic and you understand where they're coming from so this is what you'll have to try to come across to the patient's family this is very important for communicating or breaking bad news so in the next slide, you will see there is another acronym which the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine has given us. SPIKES, which is S for setting, P for perception, I for invitation, K for knowledge, E for empathy, and S for summary. So as you can see in the next slide, the explanations for all this here, yeah, that S is standing for setting, but you have to have the setting where, you know, the you cannot break the bad news in the corridor. It has to be in a close and confined place. P, perception. You'll have to find out what exactly they know about the situation because at times they might not have any realistic view of what is happening to the patient. So you'll have to know what exactly they perceive of the whole situation and then diplomatically break the bad news. Without knowing, if you trend to, you know, just point blank, tell them the bad news, it is going to be quite a shock to them. I is for invitation, which is you have to ask them what exactly the questions they want to be addressed. Can I have the next slide, please? K is for knowledge. That is, you're trying to explain to the patient in a medical jargon that is understandable to the family. So you have to avoid medical jargon and try to uh, speak to the patient's family in a way they are able to understand. Emotional support is very important. You will have to understand that they are in a quite an emotional state. It is highly stressful. And we are trying to, um, you know, trying to break the bad news to them, telling them that the dear and loved ones are going to die. So, you know, it is going to come as a shock and we have to be empathetic towards it. So we have to provide emotional support at all costs. Strategy. So once you tell them that this is end of life care is going to be implemented, anyone for that matter would like to know what exactly is going to be the strategy or the treatment plan. So what they will ask before even they ask you, you have to tell them what exactly is going to be your plan of management with regard to symptom control, with regard to palliative symptoms uh, control, as well as emotional support, bereavement, etc. Summarizing. Summarizing, I personally believe, is very important in breaking bad news to avoid any conflicts whatsoever. First, as a treating physician, you will have to summarize because when you try to break the bad news, saying that this person is in the terminal stages, it is going to be a shock. So how much they're going to understand in the first few discussions which you have with the family is questionable. So they will not be able to understand unless you summarize and probably they might be able to understand at least one third of the information would have got across to them. And then some asking their uh, members who are representative of the family to summarize back. I do it quite sort of in a way that it is diplomatic saying, can you please let me know what exactly you understand the current situation. And when you ask it in a quite diplomatic way, at times you would see that they would have, there will be so many misunderstandings and misconceptions, which, you know, they are going to voice it to the rest of the family if has, this is not questioned in the first instance and clarified. So it means they also have to summarize it and then you'll have to clarify it so that this is very important approach. So next slide, please. During COVID era, as you can see, the protocol to follow to have urgent discussion with the patient's family on withholding and withdrawing treatment is more so important now than ever. So in the next slide, you can see four important points to be discussed where be very clear and honest about the patient's condition and clarify any doubts which might arise during discussion and avoid giving false sense of hope. Second point is elicit patient's wishes and clarify who will make the actual decisions. Third, voice out your decisions. And fourth, summarize the discussion points and offer, offer support. In the next slide, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So in the next slide, as I said, some these four points are very important. So you have to summarize the discussion points and offer the support. 
finally end of life discussions so when you finally break the bad news you will have to involve the specialist team not you know, not in all critical care settings you will be involving the specialist team so sometimes the symptom control is done in the critical care itself but what happens is once you break the bad news to the family that you are that the patient is going into end of life care and and then you have to address the symptom control and things which are difficult to manage such as the psychological spiritual or practical issues in the hospital or in the community and have the next slide please so this is going to be the end of life discussion the role of specialist palliative team so in the next slide you will see that there is going to be this sort of symptom management which is total pain next slide please next slide thank you uh, so it is uh, mainly controlling the pain the physical spiritual emotional needs and addressing the social aspects as well so we will try to address in the next few consequence slides each one of them in detail so once you understand whom you've decided to have be, who is a patient who's become medic, uh, medically futile and then whom you're going to break the bad news to the family then you'll have to implement strategize how to manage the end of life care so this is going to be a holistic approach so shall, we'll just uh, look at each one in detail in the next few slides next slide please clinical management in end of life care so the medication so what are the medicines which we give to relieve the patient's pain if they may have the nausea dyspnea or respiratory secretions should be addressed and prescribed nutrition is very important are we going to continue with the nutrition which we should and uh, how are we going to give it is it through assisted hydration is it through ng tube should all be discussed documented and strategized it also is important we have to document as well as and uh, discuss about how frequently you're going to monitor the patient's clinical condition what you're going to call what are you going to be your goals what is going to be a response to treatment if there are at any point the patient should show signs of recovery what should we be doing what exactly are the care concerns and that should be addressed as well so can i have the next slide please so in this slide you will have a you can have a rough look at what how we are going to control the pain depending on the renal functions the agitation nausea respiratory tract secretions and breathlessness mainly we want the patient who is in the terminal stages to have a symptom uh, pain free as well as symptom control measures being implemented so that they have a peaceful death if possible so this is why all this has to be addressed and there are separate protocols to be implemented depending on the intensive care settings in the next slide we have the fundamental care considerations so once you see the medical management we also have to address uh, the comfort care which is the eye care the mouth care thirst and turning as appropriate to uh, prevent pressure sores from happening review of nutrition hydration feeding tube hygiene care which includes monitoring and preventing of bowel and blood and hygiene care including bladder and bowel function review review of blood product use anticoagulants and antibiotics next slide so we we'll have to document dnr which is do not attempt resuscitation in some places they call it as dnr in some places they call it dnar so we have to document in whether, whether the dnr is going to be implemented which if it is so yes we'll have to write it in the notes it this decision has to be made by multi and interdisciplinary after multi and interdisciplinary team discussions we'll also have to communicate this with the patient's family in the next slide withholding and withdrawing treatment so when are we going to withhold the treatment and when we are going to withdraw the treatment is also important so you'll have to understand that it is easy to withhold the treatment rather than withdraw because as a treating physician you'll feel quite emotional to remove the interventions we have already started next slide so once you decide on all these parameters you'll have to uh, review 
to watch monitors, we are going to, you know, what are you going to do with a supportive system like inotropes, vasopressor drugs, renal support, are we going to discontinue it? How we are going to discontinue it? Are we going to deactivate implantable cardiac defibrillator? How often are we going to do the suctioning? How, what are we going to do if the patient has increased respiratory tract secretions? Are we going to extubate the patient or withdrawal on the ventilation? Next slide. We should, when we decide to withdraw on the ventilation, we'll also have to consider respiratory support withdrawing, how we are going to do it. Alarms off, reduction of PEEP, reduction of pressure support, tidal volume, reducing the oxygen to room air, and review if appropriate for extubation. Next slide, please. So the end of life care, it also involves the family support and pre bereavement care addressing the spiritual needs as well as upholding the dignity of the patient at all costs and making this a pleasant memory for the patient's family who, who when, whom are going to have already a very stressful uh, time looking at the dear ones who are, going to, who are in the terminal stages of the illness. Symptom review is very important. We we'll always have to make sure the patient is quite comfortable in the last stages. Psycholog addressing and allaying any psychological distress or anxiety is also of paramount importance. So in the next slide, we will discuss about conflicts during end-of-life care implementation. What the uh, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine has defined as conflict is, it's defined as a failure to achieve consensus on the goals of care and related treatment at the end of life, despite allowing time, usually 48 hours, and holding repeat discussions between individual parties. So you have to understand that for any relationship which involves the family, the physician, as well as uh, the patient, the empathy, trust, and hope are the three pillars. And at no cost should this be sort of compromise. If this is compromised, conflict is going to occur. So it is vital that this, we have to make sure at, as a treating physician at all point in time to prevent conflicts from occurring. So in, in the Indian ISSM has clearly said that if there is a conflict before or during the implementation of end-of-life care, then we immediately have to um, continue the current line of treatment, not implement end-of-life care, and ask for a second opinion if need be, and very rarely a legal course has to be asked. Can I have the next slide, please? So as you can see, this is going to be a triad of family, the patient, the staff, as well as the treating physicians, strong relationship in preventing any conflicts whatsoever. So what happens if there is a conflict is you try the, or there is a miscommunication. The whole of our attention is turned towards, uh, you know, diffusing this sort of, you know, heated arguments uh, while our, all our concentration should be focused on only maximizing the end of life care in the patient. So we'll have to make sure, as I said, initially, so much of effort should be taken to address uh, and you know uh, um, clarify any doubts which might arise which is a potential source for conflict so to summarize what are the barriers to end of life care in icu you need to know to prevent conflicts one is difficulty as i said in identifying who should receive end of life care patients with the predicted length of stay longer than five days or predicted mortality more than 25 percentage as estimated by the attending physician or change in functional status that was potentially irreversible. Any disease process where the prognosis is quite uncertain. Number three, in the next slide, which we have is more than five per, next slide please, less than five percent patients. Next, less than five percent patients are coming, are coming, are able to communicate for decision making. So trying to find out what the patient's preferences with regard to resuscitation is or the end of life care is quite sort of, you know, a barrier in itself. You're not, we have to try and decide for the patient what we have to do for them. And fourth one, poor decision making arises from conflict and inadequate information between the triad of patient, staff, and family. This, I feel, is far more important barrier to end of life care implementation in ICU. The next slide, number five. Insufficient training of ICU physicians in palliative medicine. I'm sure we, over the course of years and with experience, people will be able to pick it up. Number six is inflated expectations. We'll have to understand that we live in a death-denying society. So there are going to be inflated expectations that once the patient 
reaches the critical care that you know maximizing uh, of all that they have to get all the treatment under the roof and especially so in the western world where most of us especially in uk where it has been sort of where the nhs provides funds so you know sometimes you have this inflated expectation that you know maximum treatment can be given to the patient so that in itself is a barrier they will have to understand they have to understand and we'll have to get the message right across that it is not possible in spite of maximum treatment that at times the disease sort of overwhelms and uh, is so overwhelming that it will result in terminal stage and natural death so as i say th there are i've just highlighted a few guidelines from the ISCM website basically this is to summarize as to what the indian society of critical care expects the clinician who is in acute care setting or the critical care setting to and how they have to deal with end of life care so this is sort of a guideline for you to follow on if you have any doubts or debates or dilemmas the guideline one it is important as a physician to assess for the medical futility of the patient and decide on and then consider whether it is appropriate or inappropriate for continuing the current treatment and whether the patient is the right candidate for implementing end of life care guideline 2 on the next slide next slide please concerns among all caregivers so this they take uh, it very seriously that uh, second guideline guideline 2 please concerns among all caregivers in guideline 2 guideline 2 all caregivers is very important no they have clearly stated that the critical care medicine team have clearly stated that no member of the team should address the family individually regarding the patient's prognosis until a consensus is reached among all caregivers if at any point there is a difference of opinion among the members of the treating team regarding the prognosis of the patient the decision to in initiate an end of life care discussion should be deferred and the situation should be reviewed again as the clinical state unfolds inputs from experts also they've advised us to take if need be so in the guideline 3 next slide honest accurate and early disclosure of the prognosis to the family is very important because the clinician should recognize that the family members are often living with the dying they are having this unrealistic hope which you know we as a physician should respect because till that time the patient was fine and all this is set in and they come from a non-medical background so they hope of the situation is quite sort of you know overwhelming but we when we are trying to have a prognostic disclosure to the patient family you have to paint a realistic view of what exactly the poor prognosis of the family is we should not give them at any point of time a false hope guideline four they have discussed what exactly they have mentioned in guideline four is discussion and communication of modalities of end of life care with the family the most important things to include are do not attempt resuscitation withholding and withdrawing treatment next slide please so they do not attempt resuscitation as i said it had to, has to be done by the multi and interdisciplinary team documented in the notes as it is communicated to the patients with the holding of life support is refraining from applying the life support withholding and withdrawing is disconnecting the life support previously applied so withdrawing is quite difficult even for the treating physician and uh, to do it from sort of an emotional aspect that is withholding of interventions has to be done earlier on stage once we desire the patient is medically futile next slide i'll quickly run through the rest of the slides guideline five shared decision making open and repeated discussions which they have sort of a set time and again guideline six next slide transparency and accountability through accurate documentation they're very clear uh, that you know to avoid conflicts always it has to be transparent we have to document we have to sort of document each and every conversations which you are having and the critical care medicine society has said at no point should you address the patient's family as a single member until the decisions have been made by the team that you are going to implement and what exactly you're going to implement then you can be a representative of the team but at no point should you voice your own personal judgment in regard to the treatment and once you sort of discuss and document every discussion should be documented well in the notes 
The signature of a family representative is not mandatory. It is preferable to have a life support limitation form, which is uh, available in the critical care setting, duly filled and signed by two or members of the family, as well as the treating team. Guideline seven, next slide. Ensure consistency among caregivers. This is what they've said. Communication is key, and all of the caregivers or the healthcare team who are speaking to the patient's family should be speaking the same um, uh, language, sort of, you know, say, uh, same points as the same strategy whatever has been discussed the same things have to be communicated not two or three different physicians saying two or three different things that will result in conflict so we, it should be avoided Con ensure always consistency among caregivers next slide please in conclusion, so finally, this is the end. There are quite a few more guidelines which is available in the critical care medicine website. Please do have a look. So in conclusion, so I would like to say that integration of uh, palliative care into end of life care is always very important, but it is quite sensitive topic as well. So, you know, there are a few critical care settings where they do it easily, where it is and few other places which is not done so. So it is quite sort of challenging at times, but there is, Going, there are evidence which says that once you integrate palliative care into end of life care in critical care setting, you know, the end of life care sort of pathway becomes much easier for the patient's course. The final slide, I would like to say that further researchers, the next slide, further researchers are, are happening. Thing, uh, uh, to find out what is the best strategy, best way of implementing, but these are researches which is happening, more so in our own experience, as well as from our own knowledge, as well as our uh, you know, practical point of view, you start over the course of years to have your own way of how to uh, communicate as well as implement end of life and critical care settings. So I would like to thank the current, with this I end my sort of uh, uh, discussion on the topic, and I would like to, uh, thank the Karnataka Palmanaj Association as well as Dr. Puneet for giving me this opportunity to speak on a topic which is, or has been uh, close to my heart. And to all the viewers, I would like to say, please be stay safe. Please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.